Hey, hey, everybody. It is your girl, No Mercy, here. Um, it is not Tuesday night right now, but we are back to redo our episode with Yvonne Trevino um, since we had some malfunctions last week on Tuesday. Um, some of you may know who I am. For those of you that don't, my name is Brooke Milbrook, formerly known as Brooke No Mercy Deerdorf in the boxing world. I am a retired WBC uh, lightweight champion, also a 2022 International Women's Boxing Hall of Famer. Um, I personally have been through some good, a lot of bad and a lot of BS in the sport of women's boxing. Um, this is my platform where we talk the talk and walk the walk. We want to bring out the truth in women's boxing. Um, so you're going to hear some interviews from some pioneers of the sport, past boxers, current boxers, even future female boxers. This is where we get down and dirty and speak the truth on what takes place behind the scenes in women's boxing. You definitely don't want to miss an episode and you definitely don't want to miss this one as we recap with Yvonne Trevino. Um, she has such a such an awesome story um, to tell us, which we started off last Tuesday, um, but we had a lot of cutting out and just not a very good connection. So we did cut that show short um, and we are back redoing that, recapping that so you guys can really hear her true potential and her story. Um, you don't want to miss this one. So make sure you tune in and get the full scoop here today. Welcome in Yvonne. Hi Brooke. Hey. All right. So let's let's do this again. I think we, we got everything set. We got a good signal today. I think we should be good to go. Um, and I did have a bunch of people personally message me saying how upset they were that the the feed wasn't very good. So they were looking forward to us redoing and reposting the video. So yeah. there are people that were asking me. So that's good news. Um, so I guess we'll just quickly kind of recap like the things we started talking about. We'll go through those just because they couldn't really get the full scoop of what you were saying fully with the cutting in and out. Um, so first, I guess we'll just rewind and just recap shortly um, about the beginning of your journey, um, your childhood, your upbringing, and how you got into um, martial arts and boxing. Sure. Um, my fourth grade teacher uh, was a really good um, motivator at a, at a young age. She uh, saw athletic talent and begged my parents to let me play in school. But of course, my parents uh, wanted us kids to become missionaries. So you know, I get their struggle too. They wanted to protect us and, and um, uh, you know, just they come from a religious background, but uh, I couldn't play sports and it was a really, it was a bummer. So, <laughs> um, to say the least. <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, that was the one thing that like really kept me just so motivated. Well, you know, by the time we were teenagers and just my bro both my brother and I left home, um, we both kind of went our separate ways. You know, he, he became a young parent pretty early and I was out and about, um, you know, trying to snap out of, uh, um, just leaving home and just trying to get back on my feet. And, you know, you learn right away being young, dumb and naive that there's just, sometimes you can't trust friends that you think are friends. And, uh, I found myself in a situation where I was, uh, at, a place where someone had slipped a roofie in my uh, drink and it knocked me out and I had no idea where I woke up and what happened. Um, it was really a difficult circumstance to deal with. And then on top of getting myself out of there, I didn't go seek the counseling. So that really affected me in such a way to the point to where I was just, um, I found it real hard to deal with and I was, drinking a lot and just really spiraling down a major depression. But the one thing that kept me going, of course, was sports. So I got back into uh, high school sports, got picked up on scholarships, basketball, softball, cross country. Um, and that's where I met my daughter's father. And uh, he was uh, one of the softball coaches as well from one of the college teams. And we got married and all of a sudden everything just changed. And I found myself in this relationship that was very abusive where it just, uh, um, I think it might've been a cultural thing. I'm not sure what reasons or excuses, I definitely won't make any, but 
he found everything I that I would wanted to do or anything that um, well, just to explain a, a minor, de- I mean, an explanation of what an example of what I was going through was again. Uh, I knew how to fix my own cars, I and mean, my brother and, and I knew how to change belts when they were easier to work with, change oil, alternators, simple stuff. And when we were married, I always wanted to be out there with him while he worked on cars and, you know, handing him tools and whatnot. And, um, but he felt that, of course, a woman's place is the kitchen. And again, the same thing we were battling and that at that time, women's boxing is just, it was real hard to get past male chauvinism of the industry so Mm -hmm. and trying to help him out and he says well do you want to get down underneath here and and change the fuel pump and i said sure and he told me what bolts and nuts to loosen up and next thing i know the fuel fell in my eyes and he just thought that was so funny i ran in the house and tried to rinse the fuel out and i thought oh my god i'm going to be blind now and and yeah. Able to see what the what the hell am I even in this marriage for? Because all we did was argue and debate, and I couldn't wear a shirt that had one button unbuttoned, and then it was like drama. So eventually, you know, I just ended up saying, felt you know that I wasn't. Uh, this is not going to work, and decided to get a divorce. But it became a real bitter divorce and child custody battle. And everywhere I moved or went, it was scrutinized to the point we had to get CPS involved. And, you know, I, I played by the rules. I had to make sure um, that during our visitations or if we went to their location, that the relationship between my daughter and I was pretty much out in the open. And uh, everywhere I went, I had a, I had so many offers to go train um, with Bonnie Camino at her gym. Uh, of course, the gym that I was working at, Fairtex Muay Thai Camp, where both my daughter and I were living, closed due to some type of description with the current management. So I kind of find my found myself here in Arizona looking for a pretty good team that would that could train me and that I could rely on to negotiate my fights. Here in Arizona, the promoters were no better. Mm-hmm. I had promoters that weren't paying the fighters and then there was uh, courts uh, uh, um, battles over that. The same promoter uh, and my manager in Vegas were arguing over one simple plane ticket. And I couldn't take this fight because it was a battle between a plane ticket or taking a two hour drive to get over here for one of my fights in Arizona. And these two guys were fighting over something that I just wanted to fight. I needed to stay busy. Um, That was pretty much the name of the game. Um, It was real difficult to stay busy. Yeah. Uh, This manager screwed up my fight against Jolene Blackshear uh, by not getting my weights, uh, this, the proper weight and telling me it was 117 when really it was, I was f- fighting flyweight 112. So when I arrived at that IFBA match against Joey Blackshire, I had to drop five pounds. And of course I went back to the room, layered up, turned on the heater and shadow box until I dropped five pounds. Um, it, it, it was miserable. I mean, I, there was a lot of mistakes made, um, uh, what else? Um, trying to think what else we went over. Um, that, I mean, that's a good start there for the beginning. Um, you first started off um, doing kick, kickboxing. Um, yes. Tell us a little bit about your kickboxing titles and your um, kickboxing career. Okay. Um, I've had a couple of kickboxing matches. Uh, I'm 9 3 on, on my kickboxing, nine wins and three losses. And I fought for an Arizona state title, the United States title. And I remember going to the local um, uh, professional fighter, Michael Kalbahar Hall here in Arizona. And I kept bringing all my belts to him and his brother, Danny, who was his manager at the time. Uh, Hey, I won this Arizona state kickboxing title and women's boxing is coming around. It's starting to become very popular. Can you guys help me get sponsorships? I'd love to work out at the gym. And they, Danny at that time uh, just thought, well, it's not really going on anywhere. And of course, they're thinking if they can't get their 10 percent cut out of, you know, cornering me or being there. For a fight, then obviously they don't they're not motivated. So I just stayed busy. I had. A, I already had won my uh, uh, international Muay Thai title against Kim Messer 
Kim Messer and I both fought originally uh, for the ISKA title, and she she beat me on that title. And then we had an international Muay Thai title several months later to fight. While this was going on, um, she was uh, also fly, fighting flyweight and was ha had a uh, opportunity to fight Regina Helmick in Germany, but that was canceled. And she found out it was because the IFBA in 1995 went came here to the United States to the Aladdin Hotel in, in Vegas, and they fought for the Brent first world title, WIBF women's boxing title. So uh, that's the fight I won against Regina Holmlich. And uh, it was an interesting fight because in the end, she said it was it was not her day and that it was just luck. And uh, I remember Bridget Riley commentating on that fight and she put a two cents in there and said, you know, when you fight, it's not luck, it's skill. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but she found yeah, it really she hard to accept the loss. And when we thought about it or looking back on it, she had the media, all kinds of people um, that I guess sponsors, and she had a lot of skin in the game and the loss affected her. Um, yeah. After the fight, I remember both picking up our hands and saying we were both champions here. But yeah. my biggest concern is I was realizing that even though she suffered a loss, look, WIBF is what won out of this. We need to make sure that we presented ourselves in it and made it a draw for the audience to want to see something like that again. Yes. So it was uh, interesting to be able to, um, to have that uh, world title. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, that was a big fight. And she just at that particular point in time just didn't even know what hit her. Like they weren't expecting that at all. I mean, there, you no. were probably the warm up fight. Um, it was supposed to be. be like a warm up fight. Um, right. But that's why they always tell us never overlook, never underestimate any opponent because everybody's right. coming to win. Well, so you, you know, don't underestimate anybody, but right. sometimes people overlook people. And that's probably what she did there was, was overlooking you. And that wasn't the right answer at that moment in time. Right. So well, ever, ever since that fight, Brooke, um, the rematch never fruition. Uh, right after that, Kim Messer fought her. Everybody fought, everybody in the flyweight was fighting in Germany and it just always went to the scorecards and always went to Regina's favor. But the whole time from winning that title, 1995 to about 1998, we were, uh, Jimmy Finn at the time didn't do anything for the flyweight division, which was my division. I'm not sure about the other fighters in the diff their weight categories. There was no fights happening and the IFBA was coming on the scene and I wanted to stay busy. So I accepted uh, to run for, to fight a title fight for the International Federation of Women's Boxing, the IFBA organization. And Jimmy Finn said, no, you can't do that. You're exclusively the WIBF. And I was like, wow, you know, <laughs> the guys have all these organizations that they can fight for. What is the problem? And the only time I ever re was able to defend that title was one time for ABC Wide World Sports against uh, Brenda Rouse. And she was Tommy Morrison's fighter in, in, under his stable. So that was the only fight. And there was a previous fight before that we'd asked Jimmy Finn to help uh, sanction. And it was against Delia Gonzalez on the undercard of uh, Bob Arum and Jesse James Leha undercard. And that didn't fruition. So I just don't understand what the reasoning was why he never kept us busy here on the flyweight here in the United States. But in Germany, I mean, Regina was being built up. All her fights were being built up. So I assume it was to eventually uh, perhaps get a, gain a rematch. But Dennis yeah. Diaz took WIBF over, didn't get a hold of me until about mid late 1998 and said, you know, do you want to fight? come back in and fight for the WIBF title or redefend it. And I says, well, honestly, I'm not even that weight anymore. I, I had accepted the IFBA, took the bantamweight bout, bout or fight. And uh, uh, I was stripped of that title. And I says, so are you guys officially giving it back? And he was saying, yeah, you know, we'll, we'll give it back. But I says, well, I'm no longer that weight. I'm just going to go ahead and stick with just one uh, weight category. And that'll be the, the bantamweight. So I declined, but, um, yeah, I mean, things like that just really kind of stops the momentum. You need you to keep the momentum going. Right. 
Right. And um, I would, I mean, most people would have assumed that after the, you beat homage for the title that you would have fought Messer instead of Regina fighting her right after that. Right. Because right. You would think Kim would have wanted to fight you because you had right. them. Right. But instead they stuck with the, uh, with Regina, right. even though she didn't have the title. So that right. that's kind of confusing when you're Those looking back. Those are missed opportunities. You know, you have to, while the iron's hot, that's when you got to strike. Yeah, exactly. Um, so I know, as we discussed before, you had several issues with, um, like, managers or uh, promoters and things like that and signing contracts with people. Um, mm -hmm. Can you kind of retouch on those issues that you had with those people and what was going on behind the scenes with all that stuff? Gotcha, yeah. I uh, signed a... a once the uh, uh, Fairtex Muay Thai camp had dispersed, all the fighters went to all their different locations. I found myself having to stay here in Arizona because I was going through a court battle. So I couldn't really leave town and I wasn't allowed to leave the state of Arizona with my daughter because we didn't uh, set up the paperwork that way. I kind of failed to make that um, uh, thinking ahead of time that, you know, that I was going to need to make sure it was legal and whatnot. And um, so I just signed a contract in, in Vegas and I'd stay there and then I would come back periodically and make sure I spent time with my daughter. Um, in, in the meantime, uh, this manager was a friend that was uh, there in the corner of uh, my WIBF title match. Uh, he was a friend of my trainer. So I trusted that this person was, was, um, Knew the, knew the industry and would be able to help manage my fights. But all I found was that he was getting in arguments over a plane ticket and not rather than driving to Arizona for one of my fights, you know, him and the promoter were fighting over a simple plane, plane ticket and that I couldn't take the fight. Um, then, then him and Jimmy uh, Finn got into debates and arguments over sanctioning that uh, Delia Gonzalez fight. And I'm sitting there listening to Jimmy Finn talk about how we weren't marketable that after that WIBA fight, when you look at one of the pictures there, we all had our warm up suits. We all had our hair was wet, pulled back. Some of us had baseball caps on. And of course we don't look um, presentable or marketable at the time. We just got done fighting, but yeah, you, had, weren't, you weren't going to a beauty pageant and you were, you were fighting. No, no. Um, so when he made that comment that we weren't marketable, we looked like we couldn't tell the difference between little boys and, and women. And, you know, after that, I started making sure I presented myself marketable. I, I dressed up nice for my weigh-ins and that could be a double-edged sword too, because then we weren't taken serious in the industry. Yeah. Um, it was just the way they were promoting at that time. Uh, even the commentating, I remember having a, uh, 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 what's his name? Uh, Ray Boom Boom Mancini was commenting on both Bridget and Riley and I's fight. And he said, I don't know if I, I like the idea of my wife being able to tell me, you better take out the garbage. And that if I don't, that she'd be able to beat me up and, and send me out there, you know, just talking about something as negative yeah. as that during the match broadcast, right. you know, say something more positive. But it was funny because I met with uh, Ray Boom Boom Mancini here in Arizona for a fundraiser for the boys and girls club. And boy, he apologized. He felt so bad. And he said, you know, I'm okay with title nine and you ladies having your, your chance at fighting. And he goes, I actually think it's great. And I, I totally promote it. I think, and, and it's wonderful. And it, it just, it just takes time. It's unfortunate that <laughs> it's taking, yeah. it's taking now this generation to kind of, pick up where we left off and bring it to the, the level that it needs to be at this point. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, you also had worked with um, the realtor. That's not the same person, yes. right? Yes. He's, he's the same person. Okay. Same person. Okay. Yeah. Well, so let me give you an example of some of the stuff I was going through. It's just, um, you know, I, 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 you know, I kept my personal life pretty private and, he was aware that I was going through a custody battle and he, he was aware that I had a partner and my partner was driving out there every other weekend to Vegas to spend time with me while I was still training. And it was constant drama with him now because he wanted to understand why after I got a divorce, why I decided to 
turn into a lesbian and now have a partner. And really, it was none of his business. You, you and I have a, a, a agreement with boxing, a professional agreement about boxing, not my personal life. And he, I'd come home sometimes from work or after training, and he'd have this porn on, on on the television, and he'd say, well, do you find the men's body, like, does not does that not turn you on? And, you know, do you have a problem with men? I go, I I says, I really don't. It's just, I'm not interested. It's not something that, you know, I, I just found it real. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you didn't owe him any explanation whatsoever. And that was a total inappropriate question for him to ask. But he wanted uh, as a fighter, as his fighter, I guess, and as a manager, he wanted to get to know what made me tick, but you know, you're bringing up something that has nothing to do, nothing with, to do with boxing. Right. And I fighting. eventually, um, you know, after, uh, after that, I just ended up packing up and leaving, but I left without my, my uh, passport and paperwork and photos. And he kept all of that. And I remember I had a fight in Japan, a kickboxing fight that I was going to take in between my boxing matches because I was doing both. And he says, I don't have it. And I says, you know, I couldn't get it fast enough to get out there to Japan. And then he was claiming that he, I owed him $3,000 for several months of staying there. And I had to end up going back to the back, uh, Nevada Boxing Commission and have Mark Ratner review the um, the contract because he's the guy that approved it and asked me, are you sure you're you're ready to sign this kind of contract? And then uh, we had to sever it, obviously. So we went to court and finally uh, it took about it took a, 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 an agreement of eight hundred dollars to get out of it. So after several fights, I got out of that contract. And I just didn't sign anything after that, not even with the IFBA. And I remember the IFBA wanted to sign a lot of us girls to be, uh, I guess, exclusive, or I'm not sure what the deal was, but I just said, no, I'll, I'll fight uh, and agree to dollar amounts for per round, but not any type of uh, um, contract for, to be exclusive after the lesson with the WIBF. Yeah. But at that time, because I didn't, I was finding out that I wasn't getting invited and promoted as one of the other gals that did sign. So it was it was a double edged sword for me. You know, if I stayed exclusive, um, if I stayed a free agent or independent, uh, then, you know, I, I didn't get the best promotions. And there was times where I when I did go to the IFBA, you know, you I, I get the I get the game. Promoters have to have enough funds to have an escrow for insurances and to cover everyone, judges, the commission, a lot of expense goes out. And then at the end, it trickles down to the fighters, right? But to sit there and get all these limousines or these huge expenses, I started thinking uh, there was a limousine that was waiting for us one time and I just felt so uncomfortable getting in. I remember telling you about it that yeah. The team was in the bus and this limousine was parked up front. And I was like, wow, that's a nice limousine. They go, oh, that's that's for Trevino's camp. And I was like, no way. You like I didn't want to go. I told my family, you know what? I'm going to go get in the, the bus uh -huh. with the rest of the fighters. And they're like, no, Yvonne, it's yours. Just, just take it. And I'm sitting here thinking, but why? Why this expense when all of this could have trickled down to the fighters? You know, we all probably could have got an extra hundred out of it. So, you know, I started questioning. Yeah, I know you guys want to promote women's boxing, but promote it in other aspects where you're getting um, the media and the uh, public more involved, not the stuff that's going to take us to the hotel and back. So I just was really torn about that. That really got me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, I mean, sometimes you're, I mean, you're thankful for it and you're like, yeah, this is cool. But at the same time, you're like, I could have just, like, we could have just made more money. Yeah, we could have. So it, it, a little stretch there with it. Nice, nice thought. Nice. Yeah, it was. Gesture. But it didn't wow. serve any purpose of anything. Do you see what yeah. I'm saying? It would have been better if you would have promoted the women with, with that kind of income versus sinking it into something yeah, that was a little extra money in the pocket would have went a long way yeah it, it always does um so let's see you i'm trying to go in order again since i don't have my notes um after so after the wiba win 
Um, we always touched on the Kim Messer thing. You should have been next in line for Kim. We talked about mm -hmm. that. Um, um, in 1997 is when you fought Suzanne Riccio for the IFBA title um, and the struggles with getting that fight made. We talked about that with the issues with the WIBF not wanting you to fight for the IFBA. Um, mm -hmm. So there was the struggle there. Um, we talked about Bridget Riley. We talked about her. Um, mm, 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 mm. Well, I do want to bring up a point. Remember about the point with Susanna Riccio and Major that when you have a referee that comes to your um, dressing room when you're getting your hands wrapped and they're explaining the rules that listen to their commands, if they tell you to go to the neutral corner, go to the neutral corner. Make sure your your hits and shots are above the waist. Um, if I tell you to break, break. And uh, we had the referee, Mitch Halpern at the time, the late Mitch Halpern, great, great referee. And he explained it very well. He even, he even mentioned, if I see that you're in the corner or against the ropes and you don't answer to after about 10 punches, I'm going to assume something's wrong and that uh, you're hurt and I'm going to stop the fight. And I remember the rules and I thought to myself, wow, they're being way overprotective. But, you know, I get it. I got the assignment. Um, what happened in the ring is Suzanne Rieger Major, after one of the, in, during one of the rounds, she decided to either take a break, um, maybe to test a little bit of her skills, wanted to see how much punt, you know, power I had behind my punches. But I just kept firing away, creating holes. And she didn't answer after 10 punches, so I just kept uh, continuing. And I guess Mitch Halpern stepped in, stopped the fight, and thought that she was in trouble. So obviously that was a controversial fight that was left where we both, I wanted a rematch as well, and so did Suzanne. But again, that's how strict and how overcautious they the were. commission was being yeah, at the time. Yes, um we had also talked about another fight i can't remember right off the top of my head but another fight that you felt was controversial um i'm trying to remember do you remember which other one besides the rikio fight that you were talking about last time suzanne rikio major um jolene blackshire where i lost five pounds try to drop five pounds oh, yes, that was right <laughs> yeah, where you had to lose weight because they put yeah, them down. the Arizona the Arizona promoter that was helping my uh, my aunt and the team uh, was negotiating the fight with the IFBA and the and uh, I was told I was all I needed to be was 117 pounds and I thought okay that's close to the bantamweight fight so okay I can handle that but in reality when I showed up it was a flyweight belt so i needed to be 112 and when i got there there's like no excuses you can say and then on top of that i didn't want my opponent to know holy shit i'm gonna go back to my hotel room and try to yeah. lose five pounds before the weigh-ins that's hard oh it was the worst nightmare you could possibly think of but i did it i needed the money i wasn't gonna make any excuses i didn't want the disqualification on my part and i just had to do what i had to do go go make weight yeah. And I made the weight, and it was just controversial. Uh, she suffered a uh, a cut under the eye due to an elbow shot. Um, uh, she was a shorter fighter, and honestly, I was trying to just survive and get out of the her way. Yeah, and you were literally just drained. Time, in between that time, she came underneath my elbow. If you ever look at that fight, and she uh, suffered a cut in the eye, and they stopped the fight. Um, with both camps upset saying, you know, you should have just let it go on. But again, um, that was another controversial fight. I never had the opportunity to rematch again. And when I stopped and looked back at all the records, the flyweight division at that time uh, was having a hard time getting bouts. I mean, she was like for a year and a half before uh, some of her bouts, there was a lot of time frame in between. So again, both organizations, WIBF, IFBA needed to keep fighters busy. So she even struggled with getting bouts in between. I mean, a year and a half off sometimes is that's a lot. You need to stay busy. It would be great to have a fight like maybe every six months. Yeah. But uh, yeah, that's that was the flyweight division at that time. Got you. Um, so I know that the IFBA, that is Barbara Buttrick's or not or the WI. Yeah. 
IFBA, not the IFBA, I get to the WIBA was Barbara Buttrick's baby. That was like her thing. Um, and I know looking back, like most people know, some people do, some people don't about Barbara Buttrick being like one of like the very first, like one of the very first ever. Um, and not very many people know her story, but you were obviously worked with her one-on-one -on -one and knew her well. Can you give everybody like a little backstory on her? Yeah, Barbara Buttrick back in the early days of, I, I don't want to age her too bad, but I think it was the 30s or 40s. She was fighting at that time. And for that era, she was definitely for one of the pioneers for women's boxing. And there's actually some ladies yeah. prior to that, once they start doing research, um, Sue Fox on her WBA AN network has a lot of that information on it. So definitely look that up on the Women's Boxing Archive Network for a lot of this information. But Barbara Buttrick was um, one of the uh, pioneers and she, this WIBF, Women's International Boxing Federation, was her baby. She put it together and Jimmy Finn was her um, CEO or marketer or negotiator. Um, he had a couple of hats that he was working with there. She started this. So when we think how far that came, by the time 1995 came around, mm -hmm. her being the pioneer, she was, she had her barriers. They yeah. looked at her bouts as circus acts and it wasn't a circus act. She was serious. She needed the, 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 the men of that era or that time frame of the boxing industry to take her seriously. And it was hard for her to find opponents. Yes. But to be put on a sideshow uh, pedestal was just terrible. But again, that's the strides that this industry has made. And for her to put this first women's uh, international boxing federation together was, was awesome of her to have done that. And it was definitely a, um, a mile marker for all of us. It wasn't just a, um, it wasn't just, how do I say it? Uh, you know, that we're not the only ones. Uh, it, 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 it came around at, a, at the perfect time. It was starting to, um, give, give us notoriety. And I do want right. to mention that, that time, Brooke, uh, if you remember, it was April 20th, 1995, the day before, uh, the bouts, uh, Barbara Buttrick, WIBF, made sure Life Magazine, all the media was there to cover the fights. And on the 19th, that's when the Oklahoma bombing happened and all the media left, <laughs> left the boxing event. So we really didn't have a lot of coverage, but you get circumstances like that where it's ready to be put out in public and then something happens and it doesn't uh, fruition. Yeah. Same thing, same thing with the IFBA when I went to go fight in um, in uh, Mississippi against Suzanne Riccio Major. Again, they pulled the media together, Life Magazine, Ringside, all these magazines, the Associated Press, everybody was going to be there. And um, they were there, obviously. They interviewed us individually. And then a couple of weeks after our bout, we were supposed to be on the cover of Life magazine. Let me see if I can find that. And Princess Diana dies, right? And it ends up being that she takes the cover of the magazine. Yeah, instead. Instead. So we and were just, there, but you're we, were just, just we were just running into barriers. It was just uh, interesting That's how it was. Like um, the, Clarissa, the Clarissa Shield Savannah Marshall fight um you know all the it's similar to that i mean obviously it was different different back in the day but all the build up to that fight and then the queen died and they had to postpone it another like i don't know right. two three, three right. two three four weeks because i mean they were over there like had did the weigh-ins and everything and then she yeah. passed and so then they yeah. had shut down all sports over there so then they everybody had to go home and wait another what i don't know right. two or four weeks or something uh -huh. um and that's got to be hard too, because I could only imagine all the work you do for the camp. And then you have to go back in camp after the weigh-in yeah. and fight two, three weeks later. So similarities there. Um, yeah, other yeah. people, not necessarily that they didn't deserve the spotlight, but just barriers that got in the way of huge, yeah. um, huge epic moments for women, because right. that was a huge, one of the very first right. huge fights for women's boxing today. Um, right. 
at the O2 London. I mean, it was it was epic. So, but there was it always seems like there's something that happens right when you're, okay. supposed to, you're about to get another big step. Something happens, and it like. Right. <laughs> um, so it's definitely similar to that. Yeah, but you got to um, keep trying. I mean, this yeah, generation, this generation, it. yeah, this generation's pushing okay. for it. Um, I've noticed that it's kind of slowed down and UFC has taken over, but yeah. um, the ladies have to stick together. What's wonderful is um, Sue Fox and Marianne Owen called me up one time and said, um, Yvonne, you have the opportunity to uh, uh, the Ray Kroc, Ray and Joan Kroc McDonald's and the Salvation Army was donating a community center here in Arizona. So they uh, put me, connected me with the historian who needed fit photos of all the fighters out of Arizona. They were going to put our pictures in the on the gym wall, and for one of the grand openings for the facility. And I made contact with them, and you know the things that uh, that again Sue Fox and Marianne Owen are doing. They're supporting the fighters. They're doing everything they can to make connections to help us network. Um, without them, I'm, my gosh, we wouldn't have been here. And then for them to put together wow. this boxing hall of fame, I mean, I really commend them because these ladies are carrying on the torch. They're helping us move forward. And they didn't have the chance to get titles back in the day. But Sue Fox recently was acknowledged for the fact of, of her hard work and effort and sacrifice yes. she made to get us women out there. Yeah, but in I this know. Go ahead. Go ahead. Um, I was going to just say, yes, with Sue... Sue Fox, um, I mean, she's been, even for me, like she was there from the very beginning of my amateur days, like all the way through. And I don't, and she does that for all, everybody. It's not just one fighter. It's all of the fighters. Um, and without her there, I don't think anybody would really know about women's boxing at all. Um, because she is like the one and only that actually you can find anything you need to know about women's boxing on her website. She supports everybody. Um, win or lose or what what's your record or whatever I mean all of it um, and she is just a very big advocate for women's boxing and I'm glad she got noticed uh, with the International Women's Boxing Hall of Fame you know because we could have never get in the Hall of Fame um, so she allowed women to be able to get in the Hall of Fame and now just recently they're starting to allow women into you know the the Boxing Hall of Fame uh, but only what, like within the last couple of years um, right. after her so Yes, just a huge shout out. I think I shout out every week to Sue Fox on my show. Yeah. I think like literally every week we talk about her. Um, but it's because without her, I don't think anybody would know anything about women's boxing. Because yeah, she they're gonna, one, only they're gonna one promoting it and pushing it. Yeah, they're going to celebrate her 25 years of the industry of keeping this going at, at this up and coming October one where yes. I where I'm yes. also going to be there as well. So I, I yes, I'm going to be there too. So honor. yeah, it's going to be yeah, huge. It's an honor. Yeah, but what, if it wasn't for uh, Sue Fox, like I said, I wouldn't have been uh, on the um, part of this gym, this community center here in, in uh, Arizona. But what came up is I almost lost the opportunity to be on that wall and be uh, uh, represented there is because I remember a while back, both uh, myself and Mia St. John were asked to pose for Playboy. I turned it down and Mia St. John accepted it. And the uh, his, the boxing historian here in Arizona said that the Salvation Army is a Christian organization and they didn't uh, want my picture there if I had posed for Playboy. And I thought, wow, <laughs> I mean, you try what you can to get yourself out there, but. Um, and in back in that time, that's how people were getting exposure. Yeah, they were. Anything that that's what was get. selling. That's anything you can uh, get. Yeah, definitely. I mean, it wasn't the best look as per se, because then it made people not take our women seriously because, you know, they were really beautiful and pretty. So right. they're like, well, they can't fight because they're, they're like gorgeous models. It's, and that, it's that double edged pretty. sword. Man. <laughs> right. So, I mean, it was like a give and take there. I mean, it was good in yeah. some ways because you got the exposure, but it was negative in some ways because they didn't yeah. take you seriously then uh, because yeah. you didn't look like fighters. You look like women. Right. Um, so, but yeah, that go on. But yeah, he didn't want to have you up there if you had done right. so. Well, they they did put me on the wall, and I I just thought to myself, okay, 
after this kind of interview, because I never came out to uh, the boxing industry or anybody in the boxing industry, um, and it shouldn't matter. But at this point, I often wonder, well, if they find out, since it's a Christian uh, uh, type of a, uh, organization, if they find out I'm, I'm gay or I'm lesbian, I'm wondering if they're going to put me pull me off the wall. And I sit there and think, well, if you are, the other fighter that was on the wall had assault charges. He got in a debate or an argument with an, a police officer and charges were filed. But you have that person on the wall. So you can't. Yeah, if, you know, if something like that comes up. It's it's a shame. It shouldn't. It um, it and shouldn't. you definitely people need to learn um, their place um, and what's appropriate to to know and what's not appropriate to know or ask somebody. Um, and I don't think they also have to learn to separate um, basically business from pleasure or business from personal um, yeah. because it doesn't matter what somebody's background or who they're talking to or what they're doing behind closed doors that has nothing to do with their career and that's not right. that's not their business so um i would really hope that they wouldn't do anything considering the fact i mean you've already proven yourself that which i wouldn't think it would matter if you were in playboy i mean that shouldn't even <laughs> yeah. matter um because everybody had to make money and that's what they were asking women to do back then because yeah. they're chauvinistic and they're men and that's what they wanted to see. So <laughs> therefore they were asking the women to pose in Playboy or mm -hmm. to pose in magazines yeah. that and way. I needed, I needed the money at that time, but I, I made the decision not to, yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, you just went with the roads that people were asking to take to get the exposure. If this yeah. is what you have to do to get exposure, well, I'm gonna think real hard about doing so because I need the money, one, and two, we need women's boxing to grow. So if this is the the path that we have to take temporarily, mm -hmm. then so be it. That's what we have to do, which is what I mean. The same thing Mia did. Um, I don't see there's anything wrong with it. I mean, right. That's what they were. That's what people wanted to see then, and that's it. Did help us grow. I mean, yes, yeah. they didn't really take it so seriously, but you just prove yourself in the ring that yes, we are right. serious. Well, Mia we Saint John. Control. Yeah, Mia Saint John obviously uh, uh, was wanting to be an actress, so it it helped her format it obviously boosted hers. That's just like when, uh, remember the model? Oh, I forget her name. Um, I, I remember telling, Vanessa Williams, when she posed for Playboy and it was gonna cost her her career. Yeah. And we have to get over, look how, that's the past now and how we've gotten over that hump. <laughs> and she wanted exactly. to be an actress at the time, so. Yeah, and I mean, you do what you gotta do yeah. um, and just hope that it doesn't backfire later. I mean, that's yeah. really all you can do. Um, <laughs> You were also, which I know we did not discuss um, last week. Um, you were also you also on a documentary, um, Showtime Boxing, a different look. Um, can yes. you tell everybody about the documentary, what it was about? Um, I know you can watch it on YouTube, um, yes. probably other places. But can you tell us a little about bit about the documentary and how that came about? Yeah, that that documentary uh, was set up with the manager that I had in Vegas, and it was a a. a documentary about four fighters. It was uh, Butterbean. Yep. It was the Tough Man Contest, the gentleman that, that fought all around the state for Tough Man and as, an aspiring fighter. And then a, uh, a young kid who was going to become an amateur fighter and then myself. So I was kind of packed it put in with the, those four categories. So again, you took whatever documentary interviews, anything that you can to keep the women's boxing uh, on, you know, marketable or marketed so that the public knew that we were out there. And right. yeah, that was uh, that was a real good, interesting uh, documentary. You know, again, um, the manager I was with uh, was being interviewed at that time, and he just. Uh, uh, took it upon himself to bring up a little bit of my past on that show, and I didn't want that brought up. But he was saying how he he uh, received a phone call from me, and that I was in such dire straits, and he was going to do what he can to help my career out. But in reality, it wasn't. It was something else, obviously, going on. It was the custody battle, and yeah, there was days where I was frustrated, and it it, it was difficult. And I was trying to work full time still get in for training in the gym and be a parent as well for my daughter. So it was difficult and driving back and forth. And 
uh, you know, I made it work as best I could. Um, you know, you do what you yeah. can as a parent. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, there was, there was times where, yeah, there was times where her father ended up, uh, uh, during some of my bouts, he didn't, uh, you know, during the custody battle, he was supposed to have paid his child support, but he owed back child support because once I decided to file joint custody, I knew I wasn't going to get anything out of him. Um, we filed joint custody and we uh, uh, eventually this they got a hold of his wages and were garnishing it. And the time that my daughter spent with him, he says, look at your mother making all kinds of money and I'm over here getting my paycheck garnished. And my daughter started really questioning mom, you know, why would you do that to us? And he really twisted her up really bad to the point to where I started feeling really guilty actually pursuing my fight career and that I should spend time home at and be a mother to my daughter. And it was, I was torn. I was really, really torn. That was gut wrenching. That really got me to the heart, but he just knew how to manipulate the circumstance and it's un unfortunate, but you know, you persevere. I mean, now our relationship is great. Um, she felt the wrath of her father and one day, you know, got in a confrontation with him and now they've got a court order of protection uh, against him. And now he's uh, not involved anymore because we have a grandson now, which is just wonderful. It's a blessing. Um, I can't tell you, explain the feelings of being a grandparent now. <laughs> yeah, exactly. but it's, wonderful. it's wonderful. Yeah. And I'm so glad that, um, I mean, I, and it's really hard. I mean, I don't know how she, old she was at the time. Um, but I know like for my oldest, I, I retired after I had my second daughter. So my mm -hmm. oldest one was the only one that really, um, grew up in the gym. Like, I mean, mm -hmm. it was work full time, get off at five, go straight to the gym with her, with my husband, train mm -hmm. for two, three hours, go home, grab something to eat, get everybody in bed and do it all over again. I mean, so that was the life. I mean, you know how it is. I mean, that was the struggle um, of trying to be a female fighter. You, We didn't have the luxury of training, and that was our job. I mean, you had to work and be a mom and do all this stuff. But I can remember, like, when I fought Mia St. John um, the second time, like, in Mexico or, like, when I went to Canada. Anytime we went far um, and she wasn't able to go, especially like the Mexico one, I was there for like 10 days, I think, yeah. because we had to do, you know, the public workout and then the, the pre pre weigh in and then the weigh in and then the interview after interview. And I mean, there was so much stuff going on. And so I had to go by myself. My husband stayed home with her. Um, and I mean, I, that's Chevelle Hallback went with me. Nate Campbell went with me. So, I mean, I had people there, yeah. um, but it was very difficult. Um, for me to be away from her, you know, and the phone calls, like, you know, I miss you. And, and then you, it does make you kind of second guess, like, I mean, is this really worth being away from my kids? Like, right. cause th that's like the main thing that you're thinking about. And it also makes it very hard to focus as a female when you're really trying to dedicate all that time to training and you're already working and that's more time away from them. But like I right. said, like my situation, she was with me at the gym every day. So, we weren't tech, you know, I guess technically spending one-on-one -on -one quality time together, but she was always with me. Um, so, but yes, after my second one, I did retire because I had already won the, the WBC. Um, mm -hmm. and I had two kids now I had had to think about, and you know, anything can happen in boxing. Um, and then I'm just like, I'm not making any money. Like I really love the sport, but I'm really losing money. Cause by the time you get over there and you're off work for two weeks, I really just, actually paid money out instead of getting money in because that you didn't make enough to even cover the two weeks. Yeah. You know, I mean, you know how it is. Yeah. Um, so after I had her, I'm like, you know what? We're just going to hang them up. I, I made, I'm, I got the title. I fought literally the best of everybody that's out there. Um, so I think I, I made, made enough of a legacy for, for me for now. Um, do I miss it every day? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, every single day um but that's what you got to do you know as a mom yeah. so i totally understand your struggles there but i'm so glad that she's now realized that he was just doing that out of hate and jealousy yeah. um and just trying to turn her against you and you were actually doing what was best for her yeah. in supporting her 
um, and showing her what it's like to be a true woman, warrior, champion, never giving up on your dreams, never giving up on your goals, pushing yes. for all of that. You were being a good role model for her. Um, more women need that kind of role model in their life. Um, women that don't ever give up and they don't take no for an answer and they keep pushing for the things they want and believe in. Um, and that you guys have now got a good relationship because yes. she totally messed that up and she understands that yes. he was just talking out his butt that whole time. <laughs> and we yeah. were the ones looking out for her in the end. So I'm really glad that that worked out for you guys now. And you guys are- It, it did. Out. Yes. Because I told well, you- now, Well, yeah. now with you keeping up this uh, this fight talk, this is definitely a uh, something that we need, obviously, because it's uh, women's boxing still needs to be pushed forward. And again, we uh, it's an honor just to be a pioneer and be a part of that, sharing that. So what you're doing yeah. here is wonderful. I mean, you're keeping the momentum, you're keeping the the fighters out there talking about their personal lives. We all have a story to tell. Yes, we all everybody. went through our barriers and I'm just glad that you're doing something like this and it's an honor for you to have invited me to be on here. I appreciate that. Yeah, I'm honored to have you here. I mean, your story is phenomenal. Um, I mean, people got a, a little bit of it before. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, that's what I try to tell everybody. Um, and the reason that behind me wanting to do the show when when I was asked about you know trying to do the show and I'm like well if I'm going to do the show it's going to be done right and it's going to be about the truth and the behind the scenes stuff that nobody understands and nobody knows about um mm -hmm. that we have to go through as women in boxing boxing mm -hmm. as a whole um is a dirty business um but it's even worse on the women's side and people don't quite realize what all we had to go through to get it to where it is today um, and I definitely feel like some of the current fighters kind of forgot about the path that was built for them um, to get it to where it is today. It didn't just happen overnight and they didn't do it by themselves. Like it was hundreds of us put together that each kind of built our own little, um, you know, brick and layer in the path to get it to where it is today. Um, and I don't even think they quite realize um, how much that we've all been through and what we had to go through um, to keep pushing for women's boxing to grow. So that's kind of where I am with it. And that was my goal is just getting everybody to really realize and understand the truth about women's boxing and how hard it was um, for every single one of us from all the way back to the very beginning, all the way up to today, we've all got struggles. Um, and it gets a little bit easier as we go along, I think. Um, but it's definitely not where hundred percent where it needs to be yet, but we're getting there. We're definitely getting there. We're gaining steps. Um, so I guess I, is there anything you can think off the top of your head that we missed that we talked about before that you want to cover as far as the boxing side of things? No, just, just for a lot of the upcoming fighters to just be cautious about signing contracts, who's representing you. Are they good negotiators? You don't want them costing you fights. Um, nowadays, something like Playboy, any type of opportunity where you can promote yourself and the, the sport itself behind you, my God, jump in, you know, do what you can. Yeah. Um, and just, you know, always keep in mind that pioneers like Sue Fox, Barbara Buttrick, everybody else behind is supporting you, right, has been trying and doing their best and they're supporting you and right behind you all the way to keep uh, pushing for this. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so now I guess just briefly, just because I know, um, for you just kind of mm -hmm. tell us a little bit about like what you do after retirement. What do you do with your, with your days after you stop? Oh boxing? Yeah. Um, the whole time I fought Brooke, I mean, I had to make sure that I took the type of jobs that would let me leave. So I would take a lot of, uh, labor ready labor force where I would work for like a couple of weeks. And then, you know, I told them I won't be here for like a whole week. I'll, I'll be out. And a lot of time I was asked to become a manager or a supervisor and I couldn't commit because they weren't going to give me the time off. Right. So now I, um, I've done everything from, uh, driving, uh, getting my CDL class a license and driving over the road. Um, I worked for, uh, the, the native American Indian community and I was a telecommunications technician for them slinging a telephone line and hooking up the internet and that got phased out but they had asked me if i would 
uh, stay within the community. They need uh, women recruits for patrol. And um, I uh, did that and I had a major injury that, that cost me about two surgeries to get back on my feet. And I didn't go back to uh, law enforcement. It was, uh, it was a real difficult battle to get back on my feet at that time. So um, what else? I've always been uh, uh, in the technical field. So I always, uh, everything from like my uh, uh, apprenticeship for electrician and that kind of land me, landed the job I have now. I'm an electrician technician space field for I've just been very fortunate my work ethic how I speak with people your leadership skills um, negotiating skills that kind of got me in the door where I'm at and with benefits so I'm really fortunate because of that I, I didn't have a degree in anything um, I never finished college so I didn't get my associates out of the way but if I had I would have loved to have been like a um, sports medicine doc uh, sports medicine, physical therapy, because I knew so much about that, but I utilized that for my own injuries to get myself back on my feet. Right. Uh, law enforcement was an aspiration. Uh, what else? Um, well, I know you said you got, a, you got certificates um, as for, you work with the youth or, yes. right? Something yeah. With, yeah. Well, it touched home. That. It touched home to be uh, involved with CPS, even though it happened because you know, you had a, a, a spouse accusing you of being the worst mother in the world, terrible. How dare I follow my goals and dreams and leave my child? And and it wasn't like that. Um, uh, because of that, I was able to see that it helped keep the family together. It helped um, uh, keep the family balance. And nowadays, these programs are are out there for families at this point that are there's a lot of addiction and it's breaking a lot of families up. And what uh, this attorney that I work with now uh, found that she was representing these cases and all these kids were just being kept in state custody and really not going anywhere. They weren't doing anything for the, the parents. They weren't giving the parents any type of classes to, to be, learn how to become parents. The kids were just kind of being thrown into the system and falling out of the system. And then they themselves were repeating the bad patterns and getting caught up as well. So she put a program together where through counseling for people that want to be counselors nowadays, um, there's a great need to be able to sit with these families in a facility for several hours where they get to play, they get to interact with their kids and um, build that, that foundation back up again and get their families back together. So I was, it was wonderful to be part of that team and see firsthand the positive aspects of that. So, um, yeah, I mean, that was, that was definitely something that that's a need in your community. And I, and I can't say how much as a fighter, keep yourself busy with volunteering. Um, the main thing, you, what happens to us is remember, you win these belts, you win these titles, you're on television momentarily, and then you don't get any more exposure after that. No. So you have to remember, you have to get out to your community. You have to make yourself known. If that means call up the um, the agent or the media for WNBA, the NBA, any type of sports, professional sports facility, any type of organization that's going on in your state and your community, make sure you call them up and let them know that, hey, I'm the local champion for women's boxing. Um, keep yourself out there. Volunteer to be part of these programs like I did. And because really when you stop and think about it, we have mentorships now and they're looking, looking for mentorship for these kids. And it's just something that's needed so bad. You can actually be a superhero to these kids by just giving eight hours of your time for a month. All they ask is eight hours for a month. So that's like two or three hours a weekend. And they even give you the funding to go to the movies with them or to take them out somewhere and talk to them. So it's, it's, it's good. You've got to be involved with your community. You know, is yeah. the belt, the belt can only speak so much about your skill. You want to, you want to make sure you brush up and, and let people know the personal side of you as well. Yeah. Yeah. That's really, that's very good advice there. Um, because yes, once you do retire, you know, and it settles, mm -hmm. um, you kind of just get lost and forgotten. Um, mm -hmm. 
unless it's a real, real diehard boxing fan every now and then. Yeah. Uh, but otherwise, to the general public and everybody else, you just kind of get brushed under the rug and forgotten. Um, but that is good advice there. I never really, I guess, thought about that. I know um, since we've moved, uh, since we've just recently moved, I have reached out to some of the people because I'm like, you know, when starting doing the podcast and stuff, I'm like, maybe I should just maybe like reach out to the, some of the schools and see if they need like a motivational speaker or, you know, pe you know, mm -hmm. co colleges or um, something like that. So um, I've recently just thought about that. Now I hadn't thought about yeah. that one minute before since I retirement, but um, mm -hmm. just seeing a lot of the different retirees doing that kind of stuff. I'm like, well, I could do that in my community. Like I could reach out and help some of these young girls or these young kids. Um, so yes, I have just kind of started working on that since we just recently moved states, um, mm -hmm. looking into that stuff. But that is a very good advice um, for everybody out there. Um, whether you're retired or not, for that matter, you can still do it. I know yeah, yeah. a lot of them do today, um, working with the kids and the youth and you know, just giving back to others. Um, mm -hmm. Because your stories, every all, every one of our stories goes a long way, um, especially for young kids. Um, they look up to people, um, and especially people who are honest and they tell their struggles and all the stuff they've been through, and they still come out on top. Mm -hmm. So that's the stories that these kids need to hear um, to give them the motivation um, to keep pushing and that realize that it doesn't matter where you come from because we all come from somewhere different. Um, you still can accomplish your dreams and your goals. Um, so I know a lot of the women have not such great childhoods and they come through, a, through a lot, but they still, they still keep pushing and they still push for their goals and their dreams and they still make it through, which is so much of a hero and um, somebody to look up to for people who are in those situations. And they're like, well, if they can do it, maybe I can do it. So um, and that's great advice for everybody out there to kind of just make sure you're reaching out and giving back um, to the community. Um, so I, I love that. Um, I think for the most part, we kind of touched on everything we talked about right. last week. I'm trying to think um, if there's, I would say, Eric, chime in. Is there something we missed from last week that we need to cover? Um, otherwise, I think for the most part, you covered because a lot of the questions I was going to ask you covered in your, yes. in your description already. So I don't think there's anything else that we missed. Um, my lovely assistant, Eric, is there anything that we missed that's very important that we cover? Don't think so. Okay, great. I just want to make sure before we ended it off. Um, all right. So I guess we will give that a wrap. So everybody that missed it, I hope you guys enjoyed this re-airing of the show with Yvonne Trevino. I appreciate you sitting down with me twice and giving uh, up your time so that we can try to get the story out there correct. Um, and it was a pleasure to have you on and I'm looking forward to meeting you in person at the inductions this year. Yeah, I look forward to that. Thank you so much, Brooke. I appreciate it. All right. Um, so I guess, I, Eric, I'm going to do the outro of the show. All right. Um, everybody, thanks so much once again for joining me. I apologize for the technical difficulties last week. I hope that everyone that was there trying to watch the show catches this one. I hope we kind of reiterated a little bit on what was missed that you didn't understand, and then we covered the rest of it in the end. Um, I want to thank you all every week for continuing to join me on No Punches Pulled with No Mercy. I hope you enjoyed the show with Yvonne, a uh, very, very special woman. Um, Please, please make sure you like, subscribe, and share, um, and get everybody in here. Let's get, let's keep on growing, guys. Every week, let's keep getting more people in here. Spread the word. Um, also, there is now a donate button below. You can donate directly to me for the show if you would like to. Not necessary, but if you like to, it is there. Uh, I please really appreciate every single one of you coming here with me, talking to me in the chat, supporting me. That means the absolute world to me. Um, also, make sure that you're following me on all, all of my social media platforms to stay informed about anything going on with the show or anything else for that matter in my boxing career um, or highlights. Uh, you, I have my personal page, Brooke No Mercy, Deardorff, Millbrook. Also, a separate podcast page on all platforms. Of course, No Punches Pulled with No Mercy. 
Um, once again, thanks for tuning in with me. I will see you all again, same time, same place, Tuesday at 8.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time with the next episode of No Punches Pulled with No Mercy. And we got a good one for you again next week, and you don't want to miss it. So stay tuned for when we um, get that out and promote it. It's coming out soon. But until then, punch hard. Nothing else matters. Bye, guys.